Good evening. Welcome, everyone. We'll give everyone a few minutes to uh, join us. I am Terrence Roof, professor at NC State, uh, former public school teacher and a principal and educational consultant with Public Schools First NC. And tonight I am joined by my colleague, uh, Dr. Yvonne Brannon, and a former school social worker and currently chair of Public School First and C. So again, we welcome you here tonight and thank you for participating in the, in the webinar. We truly appreciate your time. Um, tonight we are highlighting the value and the role of social work, uh, in particular um, social workers in our schools. And so we all know how overwhelming the impact of COVID has been on our students and our families over the past two years, um, from the challenges of virtual learning to families losing jobs and their homes and their loved ones to COVID, the impact on our students is evident. And, and it's in and, and the significant increase in the numbers of students reporting mental health issues to the higher number of abuse and neglect cases reported. And also, unfortunately, in the increases in teen suicide. So we also know that we do have a shortage of school social workers throughout the state. Um, and we know that the issues of our students are facing, along with the, just the great need for more social workers is why we are here tonight. And so we are completely grateful for your time, especially around this particular issue. We wanna bring attention to the public, parents, county commissioners and legislative members about the value and the role of social workers play and, and really tonight, what can we do to help support funding um, and the working conditions for our school social workers? So we have a outstanding group of panelists tonight to help us. We have Dr. Karen Bullock, head of NC State School of Social Work program. We have Darlene Johnson, the director of certificate program for School of Social Workers at NCSU and a retired social worker. And just to note, um, Darlene had a, a family commitment and so couldn't attend tonight, but we wanted you to meet her, at least give you her contact information uh, so that you can reach out at the end of this web webinar for further assistance. We have Kay Castillo, Director of Advocacy with the North Carolina Chapter of the National Association of Social Workers. And we also have our NC House Representative of District 36, Julie Von Hafen, former state PTA and Wake PTA leader and parent in Wake County. So tonight's agenda is in three parts. We have first, Dr. Bullock will present part one, school social workers. We have Kay Castillo will present part two, advocacy. And then the final piece, part three, will be by Representative John uh, Julie Von Hafen. In addition, um, so you know, of course, we will save time in the end for your questions and thoughts. So we have a chat feature, and then also we will be allowing individuals to raise their hand or unmute their mics. And so we will start with Dr. Bullock. And so I am pleased to introduce um, Dr. Bullock, who earned her PhD in sociology and from the School of uh, Boston University, a master's degree in social work and from Columbia University in New York City and a bachelor's of social work BSW degree from North Carolina State University. So our first question, Dr. Bullock, can you tell us about the education and training school social workers need and then the value they bring to public education and the important role they play at individual schools. Um, and if you need me to repeat it, I can, but uh, can you help us understand? Sure, thank you very much, Terrence, and good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to be a part of this panel discussion. Thank you for your attendance. In case there's anyone in attendance who's unfamiliar with school social workers, I'd like to start by emphasizing that school social workers are trained mental health professionals with a degree in social work. And in the state of North Carolina, 
as licensed providers of the services that they offer to students and families. They're licensed by the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction, which we fondly refer to often as DPI. And for school social workers, Primarily, I think most would probably agree that their aim is to improve the academic achievement and the social, emotional, and behavioral competence of their students. And we all know that the social, emotional, and behavioral competencies of a student can influence their overall well being. A school social worker that is employed in the state of North Carolina must adhere to the school social work professional standards as outlined by DPI and must adhere to the standards of the National Association of Social Workers Code of Ethics, demonstrating core values of service, social justice, dignity, and self-worth of the person, importance of human relations, integrity and confidence. School social workers are hired in each of the local entities, I'll call them, or counties. So for example, in cases anyone who showed up tonight to learn more about school social workers, maybe you're interested in a job as a school social worker. So I'm going to do my best to provide a little bit of education for those who may not be a school social worker yet, because as mentioned, there's a shortage and we need more social workers. So school social workers are hired within the counties, even though, as I mentioned, DPI has oversight. So for example, if you're in a Wake County school, then you're hired in Wake County. We don't hire you in Wake to then go work in Franklin County, for example, and so or Warren County, which is where I'm from, by the way. Um, and so it's that's, I think, an important distinction because Many jobs, um, an individual may be hired or, or live in a county or work in a county and work in a, in a different county. So there's some distinct features of school social work that I think are worth emphasizing. And school social workers work with the teachers, they work with parents, they work with school administrators to develop and strategize the ways in which they aim to help students collectively to focus on their academic performance. And as I mentioned earlier, to address any of the psychosocial issues and concerns that may be influencing their academic performance or the lack thereof. And students and their families are often referred to social workers when either of these, the teacher or the can come from the family member or the administrator or someone else at the school, could be a custodian at the school or someone who identifies a concern for a student that they feel would be worthwhile to give more attention. And this is why, as Terrence emphasized um, in his opening address, that is particularly important for us to understand what it is that social workers do, support social workers in their roles, and by supporting them, it means paying them equitably as well. Social workers are oftentimes managing and handling and addressing issues for our students that go above and beyond just the behavioral performance, which is oftentimes what um, individuals think of uh, what comes to mind first when they're thinking about school social workers. But school social workers also help with ensuring that our students are not food and housing insecure. And as most of us know that if you're hungry, it's difficult to pay attention in school. If you have unstable housing, it's also particularly challenging to pay attention when you're in school. And also it may impact the absence and or attendance in school. So the social workers have a significant role in our schools with ensuring that our students have not only equal access to education, but equitable access so that these very important basic needs can be attended to so that each student has the opportunity to perform at their best. And I'll stop there. Terrence, if you want me to address any other particular areas, I'm happy to do so. No, thank you very much. I, I believe we have some slides um, in reference to the certification program. Um, we'll put them up in one second. 
Well, before, if I may, Terrence, before I get to certification, if I could just illuminate a couple of things since um, if we're gonna go to certification next, or if we're gonna hold off on certification, I'd like to just emphasize in case there's anyone in the audience who's not clear about the distinction in the training for social workers. So there is the bachelor's level training in education for social workers, and that degree is often the BSW degree. Bachelor's trained social workers are prepared to work effectively with the individual, with the family, also in groups, with community organizations, as well as policymakers, to develop and improve services that impact students and families and the communities that support them or the lack thereof in the support. A clear distinction for those who are wondering, well, what is the difference you know, between bachelor's trained social workers and master's trained social workers is that bachelor's trained social workers, and I'm speaking about accredited programs, I'm only familiar with accredited programs, and all of those programs are accredited by the same entity, which is the Council on Social Work Education. And so the undergraduate or the bachelor's level training is primarily focused on what we refer to as macro level, uh, mid-level, what we call meso, case management, et cetera. And at the master's level, the trainee, the student, the professional receives a higher level of training and knowledge that centers around theoretical frameworks, assessment knowledge and skills, uh, evaluation and engagement at a level in which none of the accredited social work programs are training and preparing students to do because the Council on Social Work Education does not accredit us to train and prepare undergraduate students at that level. So I'll stop there just in terms of making the distinction between the bachelor's level trained and educated social workers and the master's level trained social workers. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Bullock. And, and Yvonne, if, um, if we can move to this certification program slides, let me share that. And so, um, Dr. Blue, if you want to talk through um, this particular slide, just to, if there's anything that stands out to you that you think would be important for the audience to know. Right. Well, as I indicated, the training that is received at the bachelor's level is particularly uh, distinct from the master's level training. And then when we think about the certification process, so what happens above and beyond getting the education and graduating from um, an accredited program. So there are three levels of preparation and certification, if you will. There's the A level, which are the bachelor's trained, the bachelor's level trained school social workers. And then there is the M level, master's level trained social workers. And then there is the S level, which um, is the advanced MSW education, which includes training above and beyond what one would get in sort of the standard MSW accredited program, but goes above and beyond. And most people refer to it as the interdisciplinary training where this, the trainee, the professional would also complete courses in perhaps the school of education an education course, a counselor education course. Um, but there is this requirement that one get um, an additional level of training and exposure, if you will, in order to qualify for the advanced level uh, training. Many students in their MSW programs, while students in their MSW program will take a course that will meet that, that criteria so that when they graduate from their MSW program, they already have that additional education piece that is required. And so DPI, issues the license for practicing school social workers. And so that's something to keep in mind because as we said at the onset, it's DPI who actually has the oversight on the state level in North Carolina. And the recommendations for licensure are required or need to be made by the Dean of Education. So again, with the Department of Public Instruction and schools of education, if you will, there is this intersectionality, if you will, between the schools of education and the schools of social work around um, certifying licensure officials, if you will, who can approve the program. So they are the ones who make sure, if you think about it in terms of an accreditation, they're the ones who make sure 
that the person who's seeking licensure has gotten the appropriate training, education, experiential learning, and they certify or sign off or give the approval for the person to then be eligible for the school social work certification. And in regards to these various levels, I think it's important Often I find that people get a bit confused and they think that, that the burden of uh, responsibility rests solely on the schools of social work to uh, facilitate a pathway, if you will, for a social worker to be licensed. But I think it's important for everyone who's um, attending tonight to keep in mind that we have to balance between what DPI requires and this information is published and available on their website, but also in conjunction with the schools of social work, but it isn't this unilateral pathway, if you will, to certification. And then specifically, the requirements are, for example, if one is a BSW graduate from an accredited program, you know, they must complete that degree. There's no exception for that. And you have to be able to demonstrate that you've completed it. And, and usually that's done by a transcript to verify it. So that's first step. And for MSWs as well, you must have completed your degree first and foremost. And then there are additional requirements. So for example, if whether you're a BSW or MSW graduate, then you must have an evaluation from your social work program documenting and affirming that you have met the 400 hours, um, either you meet 400 hours of working as a school social worker and you're in good standing, or you have completed a field placement that was in a school social work placement and if you are going to incorporate the 400 hours of practicing school social work, that takes about 10 weeks on the job to get those 400 hours. So what we find at NC State, we're one of the, the programs, one of the schools of social work in North Carolina that has that can help individuals to meet this certification requirement. And we find that uh, many school social workers get the job but they get hired and then right away they'll contact us and say I need to complete that school social work class um, and they get in the class and then by the time they complete the course successfully complete the course you know they've met those uh, hours and that has to be verified through as I mentioned this uh, official who is credentialed to do that it isn't again that doesn't rest on me as the head of the school of social work uh, Darlene Johnson is our person um, our, our coordinator who certifies for us in conjunction with the College of Education here at NC State. And again, there are other programs and perhaps there are individuals in the audience who, when we open it up for questions, may wanna talk about your program and that process. But those processes should be very similar, if not identical, because again, we all report to DPI and you know, that's the body that oversees this. But in particular, as an example, um, at NC State, we offer the undergraduate level course and the graduate level course. But if someone is attending this um, webinar this evening and they're thinking about certification, one of the things that I want to emphasize and be clear about is that if you're aiming for graduate level, MSW master's level, um, certification, then it is important for you to complete the master's level course class, because if you complete the undergraduate, the BSW level class, that will not qualify for master's level pay or master's level certification. And we're using kind of licensure certification interchangeably. It's actually um, school social work certification. And then there is, in addition to your transcript, which verifies which level course you took, whether it's the BSW level or the MSW level, then we also look to see whether you have taken an additional graduate course that will qualify you for the advanced level certification. And there must be a letter that comes from the official, the licensing review official, in our case is Darlene Johnson, um, who would then write the recommendation for the individual social worker or the person aspiring to become a social worker for the initial licensure or provisional or full licensure or certification. Um, and yeah, I'll stop there, Terrence, if you want to guide more, I'd, or I'd be happy to. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bullock. And, and now we, we can move on to um, 
Kay Castillo. I believe you're muted, Yvonne, on your end. Let me see. I think you're muted on your end, Yvonne. I don't, I don't know if she can hear you, Terrence. Uh, let me see. Am I muted? Yes. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Faux pas. I mean, how many times I swore to, um, if I ever hear that term again, you're muted. I was going to throw my, pull my hair out and I did it. I'm so sorry, y'all. So let me start back. Kay, welcome. I'm glad to introduce you tonight again. And um, Kay does have her BSW from Campbell University. Um, and she is a registered lobbyist uh, and spends her time advocating um, the, and advancing the work of um, social work profession throughout the General Assembly. She works with partners all across the state and nationally and even internationally um, to look for ways to improve the professionalism, the status, if you would, the pay and benefits that social workers uh, receive. Um, so we're really happy and to have uh, Kay here tonight. I, I already have so many questions for Dr. Bullock and I'm sure we're gonna have some for Kay, but if everybody just hang on to your questions, we're gonna get a chance to quiz them at the end. But um, Kay, I would like for you to tell our audience a little bit about your organization and your advocacy work on behalf of school social workers and, and different ways we can help you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me tonight and um, welcome everyone. This is my first um, public school's first event. So I'm really excited to be here tonight and um, welcome this dialogue because it takes um, it takes everybody to help um, in this conversation that we're having tonight uh, for sure. But so um, a little bit about my organization. Um, we are the National Association of Social Workers based out of Washington, DC. And I work for the North Carolina chapter, um, which is based in Raleigh, North Carolina. And we are a membership, uh, professional membership organization for social workers with 55 chapters um, across the uh, US. And um, North Carolina is a pretty considered a large chapter. We have uh, about, uh, I think it's 5,500 members across the state um, who do a variety of social work, not just school social work, um, but they might be students, they might be um, in private practice, they might work in hospitals, um, lots of different areas for social workers. And um, our mission is really to strengthen the profession, um, promote the development of social work and advance social justice and social welfare. And that's, um, you know, we, we believe that you can't, um, you know, you can't just be a social worker, that there's, there's, um, there's more to it than just advocating for the profession. Because if your, um, if your patients, if your communities and your families um, aren't uh, receiving the services or the funding or whatever it may be, um, then you're not able to do your job effectively as a social worker. So we really try to advocate not just for the profession, but for um, policies that would impact clients and families served by social workers. And um, <clears throat> some of you all might have know, might be familiar with the code of ethics. And that is um, kind of housed with NASW at the national office, which is really kind of our, our guiding force as a social worker. Why we, um, why we treat people the way we do, why we are interested in policies that we're interested in. Um, it's all held together in our code of ethics. So you can go to the next slide. And I want to talk, so my role specifically with the organization is um, advocacy and policy, and we do that a number of ways. Um, it's not just working with legislators. We're also working with um, local communities. We're working with um, coalitions to kind of strengthen and build um, the support for things that we're working on. Um, and so over the years, um, we have worked with, on a number of things with school social work, but I think one of the biggest, the 
a lot of folks here tonight are probably going to be familiar with is a ratio with the ratio and um, NASW recommends one school social worker per 250 students and as of 2021 um, so and I think these numbers will be updated in the next couple of months but um, North Carolina was at one school social worker per 1,289 students and while that is a really high number um, and not anywhere close to one to 250, <clears throat> over the years, we've seen this number um, much higher. So this is actually a, a lower ratio than we've seen. And that, that is due in part to legislators appropriating funding so that more school districts can hire school social workers. Um, and then <clears throat> NASW goes a bit further. When you're working with specialized populations, that ratio of one to 250 should even um, should be even lower um, so that you get more services and interaction. So the ratio also while varies wildly across the state. So <clears throat> we you might have some counties that have um, 30 something school social workers. Um, but in 2021, we found that there were um, 20 counties that only had one school social worker. So that's one school social worker to serve the entire district. Um, and I think a lot, e even in counties where you see a higher number of social workers, the, the, you know, the message is still the same. There's not enough hours in the day to get to all the schools, to reach all the needs of all the students and all the families. Um, and then let's just throw a pandemic on top of the already, uh, the pressure and the needs that were already there. So, um, like I mentioned, you know, working with legislators over the years has increased um, the ratio. And despite North Carolina not having a state budget until um, November of last year, we we went several years without a state budget. Legislators were able to appropriate funds um, through many budgets over the years, and that was really kind of focused focused towards school safety. Um, that had nothing to do with the pandemic. It had nothing to do with um, just wanting more instructional support staff. It was just with all of the um, safety issues across the country and across our state. Um, they were putting money in the budget for schools to hire um, social workers, counselors, psychologists, and nurses. Um, and that's how we were able to increase the ratio quite substantially over the years. And again, we're still not anywhere near the recommended ratio, um, but it has improved. And so one of the ways um, we advocate is every year our legislative committee and our board of directors drafts a legislative agenda. And so on this slide, just at the bottom, I have 2021 legislative agenda, um, just to kind of highlight um, one of the issues we had on there to advocate for the fun for more funding for school social workers. Um, and that's been on our legislative agenda for a number of years, because we're certainly um, not anywhere close to where we would like to be. So you can go to the next slide. Um, so one of the other um, really big issues that we've been working on has been um, the restoration of master's pay. And in 2013, um, the General Assembly removed the ability for um, teachers um, or really anyone on the teacher's pay grade to um, not be paid for their master's degree um, unless they got it before the 2014-2015 school year. So they kind of, so in 2013, they said, if you're in school to get your master's right now, you're covered by this, um, you know, so you'll be folded in and you'll still receive master's pay. But after that, nobody else will receive master's pay. And that has take, taken a serious um, hit to our profession because there's not a lot of need, you know, why would you go get your master's degree and spend the time and money if you're not going to be paid for it or, or you'll do it, but then you'll go somewhere else, not in the school system to get paid for that master's degree. So it's really um, an unfortunate and uh, disadvantage for school social workers. And, um, you know, every legislative session since then, we've seen numbers of of bills introduced trying to restore this. And I will say, you know, this past year we we came closer than ever. And that was because when the House introduced their version of the budget, um, they included this restoration for master's pay, which would have ended um, the problem, right? That that we're seeing with, with um, folks not getting paid for their master's degree. But unfortunately it did not make it into the final budget. Um, so we were we were very excited. It was you know the number when 
the House and the Senate appointed their conference committee to work out the differences in the budget. Um, we quickly got into everyone's ear and said, well, you got to keep, you know, here's the language, you got to keep it. It's in the House budget, you know, let it let us see it through to the end. Um, but it unfortunately <clears throat> was not um, in the final budget. So when we talk about, you know, some issues in the field as far as um, the recruitment and retention of school social workers um, and school social workers that have advanced degrees, um, this is a big disadvantage. Um, and, and, you know, we'll see a lot of counties say, um, we only want to hire MSWs. And that's great, but uh, they're getting paid at the bachelor's level. Now, some counties do put in enough money to make up the difference. So, um, you know, if you see a larger county that says we want to hire, um, hire you as a school social worker, but you have to be an MSW, um, and we, we, we pay you more for that, then they're using local funds to make up the difference. That's not the standard across the state. So if you left that county and went to another county, you wouldn't necessarily be paid at that same level. Um, and again, you know, when we're talking about what are some ways to bring, bring us up to, you know, value with the other helping professionals, instructional support staff in schools, um, not getting paid for a master's degree is, uh, is, is a big insult for school social workers and, and a part of why a lot of them uh, leave or um, don't stay in, in the field. And you can go to the next slide. And then one of our other big points of advocacy over the years, um, about a decade or so ago, we had a statewide school social work position, just like counselors and psychologists and nurses do, um, that's housed at DPI, the Department of Public Instruction. And that person left, and um, instead of filling the position again, they reallocated the funds internally. And um, so we had to fight for this position back, and it, and it took us um, quite a long time. We, we couldn't get legislators to um, appropriate the funding and budgets, um, even though we got the support of other organizations, we got the support of the North Carolina Child Fatality Task Force that said, hey, this is so important. We're putting it on our legislative agenda. Um, we need this person to, to provide training and coordination um, because what was happening is um, it was just being handed from staff to staff. So the school counselor coordinator was handling stuff for school social workers. And um, then that person's duties would get reassigned and somebody else would handle um, everything that was coming into DPI regarding school social workers. And um, we, you know, we, we had a hard time finding data. How many school social workers were out there? Um, and they'd have to, you know, try to find that information. So we weren't even um, on the record in a lot of ways with DPI um, because we didn't have that position. So, you know, legislators weren't making it happen. We were meeting with the state superintendents that would be elected for DPI. We were meeting with um, staff at DPI, the State Board of uh, Education. Uh, you know, if we, you know, if we, if we could get their ear, we tried to meet with them. So eventually, what happened is the the staff that were in DPI who were seeing the struggles and really understanding um, took the opportunity in in meeting and said, <clears throat> you know, let's write up a job description and I'll, we'll find the funds. Um, so internally, they created the position without General Assembly funding or allocation or recognition. Um, internally, they hired um, the first um, in December of 2019, so just before the pandemic, um, hired the first school social worker um, consultant in a decade. And, and, and that's such a huge deal because there's a lot of internal work that goes on um, that supports the profession and that brings value and knowledge to the profession. So having um, this position and, and in particular, um, Pacovia Lovett in the position has really brought a lot of um, fresh air and value and worth um, um, to the to the field. So um, what's next? Um, internally at NASW, we have a, uh, a oh, unofficially a subcommittee, a task force. I'm not really sure. We haven't we haven't named ourselves yet of school social workers, um, members across the state. We've got lead school social workers. We've got um, you know director of support staff. Uh, you just so, social school school social workers that have been in the field for a long time. Um, 
brainstorming. All right, so, you know, in the last budget cycle, we saw school counselors get this, school psychologists get this, um, and all, you know, all that school social workers got was a pay raise, which is a big deal. I, mean, I don't want to undervalue the significance of a pay raise, especially when we haven't had a state budget. Um, <clears throat> but they're seeing their colleagues that they work with every day, and they're doing you know, the same level of work as far as helping meet student needs and helping each other out and, you know, working as a team, they're getting paid for their master's degree, they're getting paid for certifications, they're getting paid to be licensed, they're getting paid for this, and school social worker it, aren't recognized um, in that same way. So we're working with um, <clears throat> our members internally and school social workers across the state to say, all right, what do we need? Um, do we need to work on a statewide certification um, that masters, you know, that would pay for a master's degree? How can we encourage school social workers to get their master's degree, um, <clears throat> to get licensed, whatever it is? You know, how can we bring, um, you know, true uh, change um, to the field that drives um, more people? into the field of school social work, retains them, respects them, and pays them. Um, and that's a heavy lift, but, but we're, we're going to work on it. We're, we've got a lot of passion, a lot of drive behind that. Um, we're going to continue to work on the ratio, um, but unfortunately, you know, without the respect and without the recognition of the work that school social workers do, it's hard to bring that ratio up. There's a lot of vacancies. There's a lot of people who come into the job and then they leave for something else in the community that pays more, um, that isn't maybe as stressful, you know, lots of different reasons, but, but we're committed to make um, to continue making change for school social workers, um, bring their value and respect so they don't feel like, you know, they're, they're overlooked and undervalued at the end of the day. Um, so that was a kind of a quick overview. Um, we certainly do <clears throat> work with, um, we work with the Center for Safer Schools. We work on legislation that has, that impacts school social workers, not just in the budget, um, but uh, just wanted to kind of hit a few of the highlights um, that we've been working on over the years. Okay, thank you so much. I hope that everyone else is jotting down on your questions. I have so many questions for you and Karen already. Um, but and I know our next speaker is going to do the same thing. You're going to be have a lot of questions for her. But my friend, Representative um, Julie von Hafen is here tonight. And I want to tell you a little bit about her before um, she starts speaking. Um, she is an attorney by trade. Um, and she's in her second term at the North Carolina House of Representatives. She represents District 36. Um, she has three children in the public school system, so she really understands what we're talking about here today. She understands what happens when kids are tardy, they're absent, when they're not in school, and what, how social workers are so involved in getting kids to school and getting them fed and, and so forth, um, and housed. Um, before her election to the House, um, she served as a Wake County PTA president, but it's someone who coordinated all the PTA units in Wake County. She was on the North Carolina PTA Board of, of, of Directors. She also serves as a certified guardian ad litem in Wake County, having another perspective on the needs of our children at a, at a, very, um, a, a very informed level, being their representative in court. Um, she received her, her bachelor's from Ohio State and her law degree from Case Western uh, Preserve University. Um, she has practiced law um, in malpractice, municipal law, education law, and we're just really uh, thankful to um, have Julie here with us tonight. And um, Julie, you've heard all of this conversation. Now tell us a little bit about what actually happened in the General Assembly this year when it comes to, to pay and social workers. Yeah, thanks, Yvonne. Um, thanks for having me tonight. And I, I'm learning a lot about school social workers as well. It's honestly, it's it's confusing. And I think that, um, and I'm glad you have my slide up there because I don't think I'd be able to talk <laughs> with all these terms uh, without a little help from uh, my assistant in the legislature and all of our staff because there was a lot of confusion, I felt like this year over the state budget and the bonuses and the raises that were given and Kay touched a little bit on that. 
Um, so in the, and she also mentioned that we haven't had a state budget in, you know, four years or so. So we're trying to catch up, you know, with some of these things. And then also with all the COVID funding that came from the federal government, there was a lot of um, confusion about like what funds are going to be used. Is it going to be state funds? Is it going to be federal funds? And so I've tried to break it down here and I know it's a little confusing. And, you know, if you have questions and or anybody wants to follow up, you know, with us, you know, please let my office know. But basically the state budget, you know, did include bonuses for teachers and instructional support personnel, which did include sc uh, school social workers. Um, I think there was some confusion about whether, you know, it was going to cover psychiatrists, psychologists, school psychologists, nurses, social workers, you know, all the support personnel that are in the schools. But the bonuses did, but there were several different levels of bonuses. And what, what you're going to get as a bonus if you are a school social worker depends on basically where you are in the process and like when, when you were hired and what kind of training you've had. So I've broken it down here. So the first bonus was this $300 bonus that was repurposed from EVOS, if you're familiar with that. Um, it was, you know, and it was only if the employee was employed as of January 1st this year, which is kind of confusing. So um, there is a lot of people who contacted my office and said, well, I'm going to be retiring, you know, at the end of 2021, like as a teacher or somebody that worked for the school. So, you know, we had to say, well, then you probably only get this other type of bonus that is only for people who are employed on December 1st, 2021, as you can see, the, the third bonus, the $1,000 um, from the state fiscal recovery fund. Um, and that was if you're employed as of December 1st, 2021. There is another bonus, which is the middle one, which is the ESSER funds or the ART money, which is the American Rescue Plan money. And that was if you're employed on January 1st of this year and you had completed some kind of COVID training. So I think that it's really going to depend on your school district um, and it has to be paid actually by Monday. So if you haven't received it by Monday, you need to contact your school district, you know, at the central office or wherever you go for your payroll questions. And, you know, and that's where you're going to direct your questions about what bonuses that you are eligible for, because the state really doesn't, um, you know, the state doesn't really monitor that. They leave it up to the LEAs to kind of distribute that money. And so those are going to be the places that you're going to go. I, we can help at the legislature as much as we can, but we'll probably direct you to your to your LEA. So the other thing that Kay touched a little bit on was advanced degree pay and master's pay. And we know that we've been fighting about this for a long time, you know, whether you're a teacher or all the other instructional um, support personnel at the school. So as I said in the slide, it, you, you know, you get some, but mostly you don't get it. So you only get advanced degree pay um, if you received it prior to the 2014-2015 school year or you completed, you know, those degrees, like she was saying, before the 2013 when it was changed. So unfortunately, you know, with the huge turnover that we've had in our schools and, you know, the personnel leaving and coming, you know, I don't know if the advanced degree pay really covers a whole lot of people anymore because we don't have a lot of people who have been here since before 2013, unfortunately. So, um, this is something that myself and my colleagues, we talk about all the time that if we want to support, you know, either the teacher pipeline or the social work pipeline or all these other, you know, pipelines that are drying up, you know, here in North Carolina, we have to pay people for the, the education and the advanced degree and training that they have or else they're not going to stay. They're going to go somewhere else where they can get paid for that, which is the right thing to do, honestly. So. And then finally, um, the state budget actually required the state to, and if you don't know, the state budget actually has a lot of policy in it. It's not just funding. So, and that can be good and bad. <laughs> but in this case, there's some good parts in the fact that it, the budget has had a policy provision that required the state to review the process and curriculum for how to become a social worker in North Carolina schools, which Dr. Bullock you know, she touched a little bit about, you know, how to become a school social worker. So the state is actually, you know, looking into that so we can figure out how to improve the pipeline. And that report is due um, May 15th of 2022. So 
I mean, personally, I think there's a lot of things we could do. One, you know, is raise the, the pay, which we'll touch on in a second. And then again, like that advanced degree uh, pay, like I mentioned. So go ahead, Yvonne, if you wanna to go to the next slide. Okay, so we filed, um, you know, several bills, like I mentioned over the last, um, you know, this, this cycle and like cycles in the past, um, you know, to support school social workers. Um, there's other than the bill that's mentioned on here, you know, there was House Bill 953 and Senate Bill 154, which were filed by other members of the House and Senate, which would have supported, you know, raising salaries for, um, I think it was for social workers, counselors, and psychi psychologists. But um, on this slide, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Leandro case, which actually, you know, hopefully you've all heard of and, you know, know what it's about. But Basically, it's just to create more equity across our state. And the courts have said that our legislature is not providing every student in our state with a sound basic education. And so um, this year, myself, along with some of my colleagues, filed House Bill 946, which was basically implementing the West Ed Report, um, which is a comprehensive report that was done by an outside organization saying these are all the things that North Carolina has to do to comply with your state constitution. And one of them was providing this increase in funding um, over the course of the next seven years to hire more uh, school counselors, psychiatrists, psychologists, and social workers. See, Kay mentioned a little bit about the ratio um, of social workers um, in our schools here in North Carolina. So you can see how with House Bill 946 and Leandro, um, that the, the ratio of uh, social workers would decrease over the next seven years. From right now, it's one to every 1,235, you know, in the next seven years, it would decrease significantly um, to, sorry, the chat was blocking my view, uh, to one to every 400. So Leandro really talks a lot about um, you know, the fact that we have to have a funding system in North Carolina, which is going to, you know, be an is going to be adequate and equitable for, our, for, for all students and all schools have to have that sufficient funding for the, the support staff. And so the schools with the greatest needs have to get more funding. And that includes this, this improvement in the uh, ratio of, of students to social workers. We can go on to the next slide. So we're technically still in the long session, um, you know, hard to believe, but the long session is supposed to last from January until about July, August of, um, of odd number of years, and that's the years that we do the budget. But this year we are still in the long session. We technically have not adjourned, so, um, but that's really for redistricting purposes, but that's another webinar. <laughs> I won't get into that, but uh, so really we're probably not gonna be taking up any other uh, legislation this year other than redistricting, but eventually hopefully we will adjourn and then we will come back again this year, um, probably in May usually for what's called our short session. And the short session and even number of years, you can only take up certain types of bills. And so um, in this year, uh, well, we haven't received the rules yet, but normally in the short session, you can only file bills that deal with appropriation, um, which is like adjustments to the budget that was passed in the long session, um, redistricting amendments to the constitution. So we could see additional COVID relief being um, distributed this year. Um, although North Carolina has actually distributed all of the ARP funding that we received, um, there really isn't any more that needs to be distributed. So unless the federal government issues more COVID relief this year, um, we can't depend on that. We have to now depend on state funding. And then of course, Medicaid expansion, which is always you know, the hot topic here in North Carolina. Um, who knows if that'll ever happen? I mean, we hear things here and there, you know, maybe, maybe not. And so I don't, I don't have any faith that that will happen until Senator Berger says yes, because I feel like in the House, we could probably pass it, but the Senate is not interested. So if you're going to advocate on Medicaid expansion, that's where to focus your efforts. Um, 
so yeah, so that's what's going to be coming up. I mean, there can't we can file additional bills this this year to increase some of these funding for school social workers because that is included in the types of bills that we can file. And I'm sure Kay will be down at the General Assembly advocating for that. And so um, yeah, so if you guys have questions, I saw a few pop up in the chat, and uh, we can uh, move on. I think that was my last slide. Well, that is really great. And we are going to now turn it over to Dr. Ruth to entertain some questions. And, and Dr. Ruth, I'll be looking through the chat too. Um, not, not a problem. Uh, thank you again, uh, each of you for your presentation. And so I'm just gonna go in order um, as they come. And so our very first question uh, says, do you see there being a separate pay scale for the school of social work, like the school uh, school psychologists, any time in the near future, we would love to have that. Um, I, it's going to take a lot um, to change some of the standards, like requiring a like just requiring a master's degree or requiring something other than what teachers um, get paid right now. We're just on the teacher scale because we kind of align the most with, you know, you can have a, a bachelor's degree or a master's degree. Um, but I think the the goal eventually would be um, to have something separate. Is there anything um, anyone I want to add to that, uh, uh, Dr. Bullock or uh, Representative? If anyone want to add to that. Um, I'll add that I think it's very unfortunate that we have this two tier or three tier system. And it's particularly challenging, I think, for school social workers who work along with colleagues of various disciplines who are being recognized and compensated for the work that they're doing. If we were as a society to, pri to prioritize our students and the importance of the mental health and performance of all students, then I think we wouldn't have these structural barriers because that's how I view them. I can only speak for myself through the lens through which I see things. Um, and it's arbitrary because we don't need to have these barriers except that it's a way of keeping some people out of the um, privileges, if you will, that others have. And a salary that's equitable is a privilege. It's not a right to any of us. And so I see this as a human rights issue. I see it as a social justice issue. And it's unfortunate that school social workers have to sort of wait in line for something that other disciplines have already received. And there aren't any really good justifications for it other than it just is. And so Dr. I would- Bullock, There's a question here that kind of relates to that. It says, I think psychologists get paid better than because legislators think they actually provide counseling and therapy to students when school social workers are actually also providing these types of services. So is there a disconnect and what people think that school social workers are doing versus the counselors or the school psychologists and, and how can we, what can we learn from that? Well, what can we do to help uh, Representative Von Hafen get this message across? Well, well I, I, I understand. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Dr. I just want to say, I think it goes back to something that Kay said um, earlier in terms of the, I'll call them structural barriers. Kay didn't call them that, but I'll call them structural barriers because they're, if we have, if DPI has um, policies that say these are the criteria for which one can be deemed whatever the higher level is, um, then we need to look at why that exists. Um, we need to, and, and Actually, Yvonne, I think it goes beyond just a misunderstanding because I think it's deliberate and it's intentional. And if someone's misunderstanding, you, know, you can educate yourself and become more knowledgeable. You don't have to rest in a place of confusion and not understanding. Um, and so I think that in order for social workers to feel affirmed and validated, if you really value the work that social workers are doing, then pay social workers equitably. And so I think that it, it goes beyond a misunderstanding. And then in terms of the structure, um, and to answer your question, Yvonne, about what can the, the elected officials do on our behalf, I mean, if, if we look at these um, requirements, if you will, for the positions and the credentialing, et cetera. You know, in Wake County, for example, it says that an undergraduate degree, BSW, is required, a master's is preferred. 
But in Wake County, I don't know any social workers in the 10 years that I've been in this role that's been hired in Wake County with an undergraduate with a bachelor's degree. So if you say that a master's degree is preferred, then why not pay people? Why is it necessary to go back and say, well, we stopped it in 2013, we stopped it in 2014, but Wake County knows that it isn't hiring any bachelor's level social workers. And so I don't think that's misunderstanding or confusion. I think it's deliberate, intentional, structural barriers. Uh, Julie, you were gonna speak. Uh, I was just gonna ask Kay, I mean, I'm sure she could add in, you know, in her conversations with legislators, you know, is it the fact that they just don't understand or don't know the difference between the two? I mean. You know, I feel like when I have conversations about this at the legislature, that they are all kind of grouped together as like one just, you know, that, that there's no distinction, that people don't understand the distinction between, but that's why I guess I don't understand like why they're paid differently, like if they're talked about as like one group. So I just wanted to hear from her what she's heard in her time down there. Yeah, I think there the misconception of what school social workers do is is huge, um, and I think a lot of it is because um, it varies from county to county and and job to job. And so some people say, "Oh, school social workers they just deal with truancy," um, when that is not the case. And I think you know very unfortunately the um, school safety conversation has really shifted that um, away, and people are saying, "Oh, school social workers." do more than truancy or they do more than this or that. And so that has really shown a light on the profession and the skills that we have. Um, and then, you know, across the state, we're even beyond master's degree, we're having, um, we're seeing job descriptions saying we want to hire someone with a clinical social work degree. We want more clinicians in our school. And so there's definitely a, um, just a, a, a lack of understanding misunderstanding structural issues with um, what it is social workers do for the schools. Um, and I think that's where advocacy comes in so strongly because we do have a lot of great school social workers um, that pitch what they do really well at the local level. Um, and we also need them to do that at the state level with their legislators too, to be able to say, you know, as a school social worker, this is what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm, I'm, I'm working in a team environment, just like a, a social worker at a hospital works with psychologists and counselors as well, or in a community setting, any other community setting or something like that. But it, it definitely is a misunderstanding of, of, of what social workers bring to your communities. And unfortunately, like what Sheila put in the chat, I mean, it does sometimes come down to lobbyists. I mean, that the school psychologists had a powerful lobbyist and they were working the system. And unfortunately, a lot of times the inequities just come from, from that. I mean, Kay's organization has done a fantastic job, you know, down there and they're much more visible probably than they have been in the past. And I just wanted to tell Dr. Bullock that I wrote down what you said, that you don't have to rest in a place of misunderstanding. I'm bringing that to the legislature because that could apply to many things down there. So thank you for that. Yeah, that thank was you. beautiful. Thank and you know, you. I have a question for all of you to kind of follow up on this. Um, what, somebody put in the chat, you know, why are the red, our, our representatives, what are they in master's pay? Why do they cut it out to begin with? Why are they so against paying educators at the master's level? Julie, could we maybe just speak to that just for a moment as, as we try to understand, seek to understand, because we want to all end up at some point after this call, I hope, with some call to action, some things we want to do um, to make this better. Um, and one is, um, I, so I, what have you heard? You've been down there lobbying to restore it. What, what's the pushback? You know, honestly, I don't really know other than just kind of a general dislike of public education and public schools. And, you know, unfortunately, we've seen that in a lot of policies that have been passed down there. And, 
you know, I just don't, I do not understand it because I feel like, you know, we hear a lot about workforce development and, you know, want, wanting people to, you know, have these degrees and their certifications to, you know, get North Carolina's workforce, you know, the top that it can be. But when teachers and social workers and other people go and get these advanced degrees, like they, you, they say that they want people to do, you know, they want them to go to community colleges or go to our university systems and get all these things, but then they don't, they don't pay them. And what other industry, you know, are you going to go work at, you know, in the private sector? I mean, you're going to, if you're get an advanced degree, you're going to get paid for it. And I mean, honestly, I've never heard one good reason, you know, why this is not happening. And, and also I hear a lot that there are, there is Republican support for this, you know, at the legislature, but, you know, unfortunately there's a few people down there that control the entire narrative. And if you can't get them on your side, it's not going to go anywhere. And like I said before, you know, Medicaid expansion, there's literally a, probably one person in this state that's holding it up and it's just it's really sad to be honest. And so, you know, I think that if that one person or a few, you know, top leadership would agree to increase master's pay, I think the whole, the entire rest of their caucus would, you know, go along with it. Um, Cause I'm sure they hear a lot from their own, you know, teachers in their own districts that this is hurting them. So let me throw this out there. I've been at the general assembly advocating for helping professionals for 20 years. One of the things that I hear about the master's pay for teacher, the excuse given that I've heard, Julie, um, is that you know you 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 you've been hired to teach math. You went to school to teach math. You have a math math education degree. Um, getting a master's uh, in anything isn't going to help you be a better teacher in math. Uh, so they you know so we said okay then narrowing down what kind of masters you get we okay that's great right so even if you get a master's in math education they're saying that that doesn't help you be a more effective a teacher or uh, be a better job at it so that doesn't make a logical sense to me I'm with Karen I mean I can't I can't get this to sink in my brain but Karen when you go from being a BSW and a MSW what is that value that we need to explain to people that someone gets that does make them do their job better and make them more, more, more uh, efficient and effective at it? I think that for, first I wanna say that I don't think it's just the narrative that would influence the decision. I think um, those who have the power to make the decision need to see the value in what we do in order to feel that we're worthy of compensation. So if you don't value the service that someone is providing, then you're not going to believe that it's worthy of the compensation that they're asking for. So I think I just wanna digress for a moment to say that one of the ways we could help people to understand what social workers do and how valuable we are is to walk out and not be available. If social workers were to walk out and not be available in schools, then everyone would understand what's missing and they would understand what's different about what social workers do than what teachers do, than what psychologists do, than what counselors do. And I am fond of my colleagues who are psychologists and counselors. So this is not to say anything disparaging about my colleagues and other disciplines. I'm simply advocating for my own discipline. And so I think if there was an absence of social workers, if they didn't exist, then they would understand what the value is. But to answer your question about what is the distinct difference as I said earlier, social work, it's, it's very clear to see in social work education because we're an accredited discipline. So the Council on Social Work Education accredits undergraduate programs to teach particular curriculum. Our undergraduate students have field placements and practicums in which they are learning specific skill sets in which it's evaluated, et cetera. At the master's level, the graduate level social workers are doing something distinctly different. We use measurement tools. We use our field education tools. Field is our signature pedagogy. So if anyone wants to look at what's the difference between a BSW education and an MSW education, you would see, for example, BSWs have one semester of an internship that is not highly 
clinical or doing the level of things that graduate students are doing. It's very clear to see that. We have different uh, practice behaviors, practice competencies in which individuals are evaluated on and measured. So if they were looking for data, the data is there, but it's not data that they're looking for. Um, but the distinction between the two are very apparent by looking at the curriculum, by looking at the assessments, uh, by looking at what it is that a master's level social work student is doing differently than an undergraduate student in their field practicums and in their course curriculum. So Kay, as you think about this year, you're getting ready now to um, look at towards the short session that our representative mentioned. Um, what are you going to be doing and what can can advocates like us do to support your work? Is there going to be uh, is there going to be a walkout? Karen and I are ready to go. Um, or is it going to be a call for a day, um, a day of action? Is there going to be a lobby day? Um, is there a way that we could get involved with supporting your organization? And, and helping those advocates we have at the General Assembly and improve not, not improve the pay, because that improves you know, our, our pipeline and keeps people there, gets people there and keeps them there, but also improves those ratios. Um, what, what can we do? That's a great question. So we haven't formalized um, anything yet. We just hosted our first um, town hall. Um, we've had a subcommittee meeting for the past few months, but some of the things that we're kind of envisioning um, and kind of putting into motion is um, some groups working on um, how do we, you know, how do we restore master's pay? How do we bring um, respect back to the profession and schools. Um, we're going to be training up school social workers to share their stories, to meet with lawmakers, um, to say, you know, I'm a school social worker. This is what that means. Um, here's my degree. Here's that. You pay me at this level. You know, I make this much, but I have advanced degrees or whatever um, scenario works best for um, kind of that storytelling and um, that way legislators can better understand what it is that school social workers do without just lumping them into a category or an assumption that they have in their mind. Um, so we might do a, a targeted advocacy day, um, really kind of need the legislature to finish up their long session <laughs> so we know what their short session schedule is so we could get something on the books um, if that's the direction that the group goes, but um, really going to be working on getting school social workers across the state to communicate at the local and the state level. This is what I do. Um, this is why I'm needed. And, you know, if you, if you don't hear that, you know, then, then we'll walk out or we'll do whatever um, it, you know, it takes for you to hear that. But I think um, really empowering school social workers. Um, you know, it's in our code of ethics to take social action and political action um, and advocating for ourselves, um, you know, just the same way that we would advocate for our clients and our families and our communities. So um, we envision a couple different things, but certainly getting more school social workers comfortable with talking to their elected officials about what they do to try to reduce that misunderstanding. I think it's so we've got a couple list. of um, a couple of direct messages, and cer certainly people are being very supportive of a lobby day or an action day or um, walk in or walk out day. You know, something that uh, that that pinpoints this. Um, K and now, now, Dr. Bullock, what role do uh, universities and colleges have to play in advocating for um, some of these issues? Right, I mean. You're you're you are such a fantastic advocate tonight of explaining, helping us understand the value of social workers and the role they play and the difference in the degrees. And you have me convinced that you know they deserve master's pay, and they deserve to be you know um, those are should, so there's a reason to get your master's and it does, you know. But is there anything that we can expect from our universities and our colleges? Is there anything that uh, Representative Von Hafen can do or Kay can do to reach out to universities and colleges to get them to help advocate for, for a master's pay? Well, I think that um, students are, are in a wonderful position to engage in advocacy because they can mobilize and they have the free will to um, 
you know, protests and all those kinds of things. So students stand ready for these types of advocacy activities. But I would be remiss if I did not comment on the fact, I mean, this misunderstanding of social work. And um, I, I have an appreciation for those who see things through this lens that we are misunderstood. But I would say that there is a recognition of the value in what we do if, if Wake County or any counties or DPI or whomever says we prefer master's levels, master's level trained practitioners, then they must understand the value of being trained at the master's level because if not, they wouldn't require, they wouldn't um, prefer it. So if bachelor's level is required, then why doesn't Wake County start hiring bachelor's level social workers, right? There's a reason why they don't. And so I think that we can't say enough about the fact that there's a disconnect between what's considered a misunderstanding and what, what individuals are willing to do and advocate for. And so in terms of what we can do in schools of social work, for me, it's very challenging to continue to promote school social work among our students when I see the inequity. It's really difficult for me to stand in front of students and say, consider school social work when I know that they're going to get they're going to get bachelor's level pay. And so um, we need social workers. There's a shortage of social workers. We've heard this tonight. But if the state isn't willing or counties aren't willing to compensate social workers, then I don't think we should continue to promote social work as a discipline if people have to be paid inequitably and devalued. And so it's, re it's really difficult to advocate for it social, and it's personal for me, I'll say this, my brother's a school social worker, and every week I get to hear about the challenges and the work that he's doing on the front lines, in communities, finding students that haven't shown up, helping, haven't shown up, helping families to get housing and food insecurity, all these things that matter so much, but yet they're not recognized for it. It's, it's just offensive to think that this is the way in which we care for our students and our families who have the highest need. So uh, I take it personally too, Karen, because that's how I left social work. I started off my career as a social worker. And then I had wanted my children to go to college. So I had to go back and get my advanced degree and get paid for it. Because, you know, that's that's what, like Julie said, you have, you have to do that. So I take it personal too, because it's a, and I, I want to just give everybody a chance to comment or ask some other questions. I love Kay the slide that you had when you started talking about social work and you said that what you are all about, what social workers are all about is not just social welfare, but social justice. And I think that's such a beautiful way to present a profession. Um, and I wonder, Karen, if it's almost used against us, <laughs> you know, sometimes, but I think that's such a beautiful thing to say. Um, so, you know, that you're interested in the dual a dual twin focus on not just social welfare, but social justice, because how can you carry out your job without advocating for, for that equity for children, right? So I just wondered if anybody else wanted to say anything about that, or any of our, any of our attendees tonight, you can unmute yourself if you wanna ask the question yourself. We've been reading your questions from the chat, but would somebody like to raise their hand? Does someone have, um, you know, Terrence and I will call on you if you'd like to make a comment or share some thoughts or ask some questions yourself. Anybody? Can I just add something while everyone's thinking yes. about what they want to say? Um, one, I'll just say that, you know, the social justice piece of being a social worker, I mean, what you said about that 20 counties only have one social worker, that is what the theme of Leandro is about and why why do we have so we don't even have that many here and i'm in wake county you know but the fact that there's all these counties that have one is the inequitable landscape of our public education system here in north carolina and why leandro is so important so please keep advocating for leandro it's in court right now but there's a great organization called every child nc if you're interested in getting involved as social workers we need your voices in the leandro fight as well and i'll just add for for Kay and all the in the social workers who are listening to this tonight as far as getting your stories told to your legislator that is the most 
effective use of your time is to personally tell your story about like a student that you helped or a family that you helped and how it affected their lives and their education. That is the number one way, you know, we get a lot of facts and data and numbers at the General Assembly, but those stories, and I wish that like, you know, with COVID, I know we, you can't probably invite them to come to your school and like see what you do, if you can do that. Um, but if you can't, you know, just bringing those stories and I'll just tell one quick story about uh, a, a music therapist invited me to come and see what she did at a um, assisted living facility. And I am a huge advocate for music therapy after I saw what she did. And so that is like, I tell that story all the time because I didn't know what music therapists did. And I thought, why am I advocating for this? It sounds weird and I don't know anything about it. But when I saw it firsthand, now she and I have a relationship. You know, she emails me like, you know, we talk about her clients. And so that is like the number one thing that I would tell you that if you develop that personal relationship with your legislator and tell those personal stories, that is how you're going to make a difference. Anyone else, anybody else have any other comments, questions, Dr. Ruth? Well, Bri Bri Brianna is a intern uh, from the School of Social Work at NC State and was just sharing that she had a chance to shadow um, social workers in the field and just firsthand is seeing how undervalued they are um, as professionals. Well, thank you for sharing that, Brianna. Um, I, I would say this to Kay and um, Dr. Bullock, and both of your um, lobbying as well as your research and your professional uh, jobs, we would love, love, love if you would share with us those facts and figures. Um, I, I, I'd love to have had that data last year about 20 counties had one social worker. And I talk to people here in Wake County every day. And, and you know, your ratio of one, uh, 1,235, I can tell you right now that two of my dear friends our social workers in Wake County. One of them has two schools, uh, okay, a middle school and an elementary school. And I can tell you right now that that's, <laughs> but those two schools together are more like 3,600. And that's what she has. She goes three days, three, you know, every other day, right? Every other day. Another one has just a high school. And she's thankful that she's just at a high school. But guess how many kids are there? 2,200 kids. Um, so the, these ratios are averages and some have more or less, but I'm telling you that even in high, um, uh, high wealth counties, there is a struggle to, um, we, we still don't have enough social workers and there's a struggle to get enough social workers, even, you know, uh, uh, even if you have the money. It's sometimes not even a matter of money. When we looked at school psychologists last year, we found the same thing there was about 40 counties that had one school psychologist or they were vending out all of their testing. They were doing no testing for special needs kids in their schools or learning disabled kids in their schools. So we know we can do better for, for uh, public education. So we know that um, Representative Von Hafen is telling us some good advice here to get down there. But y'all share with us any of this information. We'll make sure it gets out. Um, we encourage anyone on this call, if you want to write a letter to the editor, we believe very strongly in that process. If you want to write an a op-ed, if the paper won't take it, we'll publish it. We have a mailing list of over 100,000. We're, you know, uh, Dr. Blaylock, I invite you. If you'd like to write something, uh, Kay, uh, we'd be happy to publish that and send it out on one of our newsletters because we really think the way that we're going to make a difference so we really want to push really hard this year and next year on working on the issues of, of social school social workers and helping professionals. And so um, please please give us information. We will we will help you get it out. And Yvonne, I wanted to add um, in thinking about you mentioned action steps. And one of the things we talk often about here at NC State is let's make sure we're taking care of the home front first. So we look within the school. If I need to get in front of students and faculty members to address questions when they have them, let's get our question answered at home first. So 
for school social workers, um, and I don't know how often you're talking with the leadership at DPI, but when I read the comments like the one uh, Ms. Sheila Pittman put in the chat box, it says, I think psychologists get paid better because legislators think they actually provide counseling and therapy to students when social workers are actually providing these types of services. I would say that those are questions that should be asked of those who write the job descriptions. What do the job descriptions look like for social workers? And what is it that that's in those job descriptions that is causing so much confusion. If social workers are doing things on the front lines that nobody knows that they're doing or that DPH isn't with us in this advocacy because DPH should be with us and I'm not suggesting that DPH isn't, I'm simply stating that DPH should be because those are your gatekeepers to your discipline as school social workers. And so there should be some communication internally before you go to the legislators to say, let's make sure we go together. What is it about these job descriptions that are keeping us from being able to get master's level pay? And can we revise these job descriptions? Because if there's confusion and the job descriptions aren't reflecting what it is the social workers is doing, then you have an internal problem. And I think we need to address those and go together if we're gonna go to the elected officials. So who is responsible for writing and approving job descriptions? DPI, you're saying, or, or personnel, office of personnel? I mean, who's responsible for that, Julie? Is that Kay? I honestly don't know. Karen or Kay, do you know? Well, I wouldn't know. I could tell you who is at NC State. I know that at the School of Social Work, if I'm hiring, I'm the one that's writing the job description. And so I know what it is that employees are doing. I would think that school social workers have a right to know who's writing the job descriptions and why is it that a job description says one thing is preferred but they won't pay people for it like i think there needs to be some internal discussions and clarification about that so there's no um there's no job description at that dpi um supports that for school psychologists or librarians or um counselors or social workers that's driving the requirements for masters and there's and the supplemental pay that goes with it. Maybe we have someone in the audience who can answer that question. Someone who's internal, who works closely, who hires, perhaps someone who knows who writes those job descriptions and who decides. Is there anyone? I think I think most people are commenting that it's the it's the individual districts, the school districts that write those descriptions. Then that's yeah, where we they, need to they, have the conversation they have to with. Yeah, they have to pull them from the state. So, so it's my understanding that it is from from DPI, but it's written based on what the state law is. So, since the state law is um, not masters only, then they um, they they write it, <clears throat> you know, from there. So then the local districts can make changes based on their preferences and you know what they can hire, um, you know. But but they can't just create a brand new job description. So then that's what needs to be taken, I would think, to elected officials is to address these barriers. Like, why does that exist? And can that be changed? Or because if not, then, you know, everything we're discussing is a moot point. Yeah, this seems like to be a critical thing. And, 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 and Julie, maybe you can help us ferret this out sometime later with um, your staff. But it seems like... It, if we have a new person at DPI, and that's the liaison, a place to start would certainly be those sanctioned or endorsed job descriptions that DPI holds for these positions. Because someplace along the way in the Office of State Personnel, someplace, right, uh, a job description was, was written for a school librarian, and it says requires master's pay. You have to have a master's of you know, library science and school psychologists, and it says, da, 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 da. So it, it, it would seem like it'd be important, and we may need some, some help, Julie, by figuring out, and Kay, uh, who, who's kind of doing that? Um, and, it, and if not, if there's not a sanctioned job description at DPI, then we need to see if our liaison person there, like Karen says, will endorse one, will help write one and endorse it, and, and take it to the you know, General Assembly and ask for that to be the basis of, make, of the pay decisions. Because that does seem to be, I mean, the leadership that's there right now did not create these job descriptions. They, they've been around for a while. And I think Karen, you really hit the nail on the head 
that we've got to get to the root of this, and that is how we can get these job descriptions lifted up and, and, and to be more inclusive of the clinical work that's done and more distinguished between the BS and the, and the MS. And, and hopefully that's a justification for uh, uh, the master's pay. Um, now, I will tell you this, I talked to two legislators last year who were one Republican, one Democrat, and they said we cannot require masters in social work in our rural community because we don't have any who live here, right? There's no one who's going to, to you know, we, we're, we're half struggling to get BS studies. So to me, Julie, the, con the compromise there short term is, is you don't require it, but if someone earns it, you pay them for it just like we've done with teachers in the past. It's not required to have a, the teacher to have a master's degree, but we pay them it when they get it. So that seems to be at least, at least a bridge compromise that we could be asking for, Kay, like we, you know, that's not required, but it is honored and paid uh, the same way we, we pay it for other help and professionals, so. And I want to say as a voice from schools of social work, we would never advocate for enforcing or forcing rural counties that can't hire someone at the master's level to require it. But if you have a preference for a credential and you get that in a candidate, then okay. that person ought to be compensated for that. And, and whatever the structural barrier is, and I'm not, I do not know, and I'm not in any way proclaiming that it rests on DPI, but since DPI is has the oversight for this, if it's elected officials, then we ought to at least hear from DPI, it's not us, we've tried it, we can't change these job descriptions and, and to the point that Kay made, if it's whomever at the state level on high or whomever is is where we need to be giving voice to and if people continue to be confused about whether we matter or not then we ought to walk out and let them have some days without us or weeks or months without us um, as social workers and then maybe they will reconsider compensating us for the work that is valuable I do yeah. want to address because someone keeps putting it in here where do the one to one one to four hundred ratio come from in Julie's chart that came from the West Ed Corporation who did the re research. Uh, why did they say 400 instead of 200? I think that, you know, I don't know, but I will tell you that following that research and development of the report and the reporting of the report, I think they were trying to go from 1235 down to the most reasonable level they could get with the money over seven years. I don't think it means that we should stay there. I think what it meant was that they were trying to go from, you know, 1200 down to 400 and do it in what they thought was a reasonable increase in the budget each year. Um, and other groups that you saw on that list didn't have to move around as much because, you know, the counselors were already at a better ratio. Um, but the school psychologist, someone said, well, they do pay for school psychologists at the master's level. I do want to say this, Sheila, not many, I mean, we have a tremendous number I don't want to quote it right now of, of counties that do not have any school psychologists. And it's not just that the pay, it's that they can't get the position. They, there, there's, there are not enough people coming into the pipeline for school psychologists and there are not enough positions. And so they are working really hard, the school psychologists feel, to recruit and to create a, a pipeline for more and more people by getting internships and so forth. So, um, in, and in fact, they, they have actually vended out most of their services. Like I told you, they hire companies to come in and do the testing. They're not even providing any services. It's really depressing. If you add these things together, like Julie said, if you add together that we've got a not enough school psychologists, not enough school social workers, not enough nurses, we had the same situation last year. We had some two school systems that didn't have any nurses and at one time, and we had one, three school systems had one nurse for the entire school district. So these, these health and professionals aren't fighting each other. They're supporting each other and lifting each other up. But the, 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 there's not a school psychologist out there that doesn't think that school social workers ought to get paid too. Um, this is a separate issue and the one that we have to fix. And Karen, uh, I thank you for that clarification and Kay and Julie, um, all of us, let's keep working on this. Let's see if we can get that going because that seems like it's a big 
basis to work on and to start lobbying on is to have a clear uh, job description and have one that's set, got levels, right? Like BSW, you know, social worker, MSW, social, school social worker, so that we can do some, some true lobbying. In the meantime, um, Julie, give you one more time here before we're going to start hanging up here. I want everybody to have a chance to make a final comment. And Dr. Ruth, I want to invite you to do that too as a professor of social work, um, working with interns. I want to invite everybody to have a chance to if you take two or three minutes and kind of share your last thoughts with the audience. I would really appreciate it. And, and maybe we'll start with you, Julie, since you finished last. Um, any comments you want to share in closing? No, just thank you so much for doing this tonight. I think this is just a topic that you know doesn't get a lot of advocacy is really important. Your advocacy is really important and, you know, keep being in tune to what's going on because this year we'll have a lot, you know, coming out. I think there'll be some decisions in the Leandro case. Of course, we have an election coming up in November. You know, I always have to plug that, you know, your state legislature and those races are the most important races and don't get nearly enough attention. Most of the decisions, all the decisions that we've been talking about tonight are made by your state legislator. And so if you wanna see a change, you know, and, and your representative or Senator isn't doing the things that you want them to do, you know, you have the right to go into that ballot box and, and make a change. So just pay attention, stay engaged, and thank you so much for all that you do, do if you're a social worker listening tonight in our schools. Really appreciate it. Okay, I'm going to pick on you next. I echo a lot of uh, what Representative Von Haven just said that um, it, you know, does take a lot of advocacy to <clears throat> to move this mountain. There's a lot of needs out there, um, you know, from the bachelor's perspective, from the master's perspective. Um, but, you know, if, if you don't have your legislator on speed dial yet, I don't even know if speed dial is still a thing on your favorites <laughs> contact list, whatever the, whatever the term is now that you can easily access their number. Um, that's something really important to do because you, um, as a school social worker, are holding up their district. I mean, there's no other way to say that. If you weren't out there meeting the needs of the of the students and the communities, then um, our, our children don't stand a chance and our families don't stand a chance. And um, so while that may feel like a heavy lift to put that on your shoulders, um, advocacy-wise, know that you're not alone. Um, there's power in numbers. There's power in working together and sharing the same messaging. Um, NASW as a membership organization for social workers would love to help you with your talking points or that first email to your legislator or whatever it is um, to get you rolling. Because, But your voice is, is definitely more powerful. And um, like Representative Von Hafen said, even sharing a, a, a story about um, you know, a family that you've helped and how you've helped them can go a really long way in them remembering when it comes time to what are the needs that I want you know, as a legislator to put forward for the legislative session. Um, you, might, you might come into mind and, and your story might come into mind and that could be the difference. And Kay, get us any of those talking points. We'll put them out there. Facts and figures matter. And I think it is, uh, we have a, pop, uh, a citizenry that wants to be educated. Dr. Bullock, I'll give you a chance to share some, some thoughts. Thank you. I am so pleased that I had the opportunity to serve on this panel with Kay and with Representative Von Haven. Um, it's just been really delightful. And NESW does uh, monumental work in the community across the state for its members. And I appreciate Kay, you and Valerie and all that your team um, does for us. And I, I look at this comment that's in the box from Lucretia Henderson asking how can we get more social workers involved on the state level. And I'd like to respond to that by saying that Kay referenced the fact that they, uh, they have organized a group of social workers. And I would hope, Lucretia, that there will be opportunities for forums like the one that she mentioned that they just recently held. It sounded like it was very successful and hopefully there'll be more opportunities. But I, my closing statements are that 
I would just like to say that I know that social worker, school social workers are leaving the field every day. Social workers are retiring, just the kinds of comments that we heard earlier. They're deciding, you know, I'm going elsewhere. When you have a high caseload, like 400 or even 250, 1,000 students, you know, it's, it's virtually impossible to be effective. And it's sort of the chicken and egg, which ones come first? You know, the administrators are saying the social workers aren't doing this. How valuable is the work? But we're overburdened and overworked and overloaded, so we can't be as effective. And so my appeal to everyone is to just think about the fact that we're losing school social workers every day and what the impact will be on the students and families. And many times social workers are working with the students and families who have the highest need. And I think this is part of the reason why we see a lack of attention and mobilization, which is you know, a theme throughout across our state in many different areas, whether it's healthcare or where in which the communities that often have the highest needs are the last to be attended to. So it's a true social justice issue. I'm happy to engage students and others um, in this effort to bring about change. And I think we need to be feel very comfortable and empowered to say some things that make some people uncomfortable, which is that we don't know where the information is. We don't know, you know who's holding up the bar or the barrier, but it's time for us to start drilling down and figuring out what is getting in the way of social workers receiving equitable pay. Thank you. I hate to do it to you, Dr. Ruth, but you have to go after Dr. Bullock. That's a hard act to follow. I, I just, I just got to say, I'm teaching, I'm actually teaching right now, early in the semester, a course on advocacy and social work. And this was a master's class <laughs> on why advocacy is necessary in social work. And so I just want to thank um, all the students who attended and are here um, tonight. But also, we're following up this webinar with one where the panel is, is going to be filled with actual social workers who are in the field right now. And uh, so we have the dates of March 24th, and we're looking at one in April. And really, it's just going to be a conversation with school social workers um, from around the state and from different grade levels. And so I just want to thank uh, the panel for providing just an excellent example of why advocacy and social justice is necessary in social work. Um. Let me let me get here so I can. OK, Did, can you see my screen? I wanted everybody before I typed it in the chat, but I wanted everybody to quickly jot down any of these emails that you need. I'm sure there's a lot of questions that you still have uh, or thoughts, or you might want to reach out to Kay for the, some facts and figures or talking points, or you might want to reach out to Dr. Bullock and say, Hey, I still want to be a social worker. What can I do to get in your program? Uh, Dr. Ruth, I want to be in your class. And uh, you'll never find a better friend for what's good for public schools than, than Representative Von Hafen. So you might want to reach out to her. She, also, she represents every citizen in North Carolina, even though she's from a district, because she cares deeply about what goes on in our public schools. And that's really the big focus of tonight, right? We want to make sure that what's going on in our schools for our teachers works and that support staff works. Um, and I will share just a few final slides with you and then you'll be able to go back to your life. Um, I, th this is what Dr. Ruth was mentioning. We're gonna have, he and I'll be hosting some social, uh, school social workers. In fact, Karen, your brother is gonna be on our panel on February the 24th. So we're gonna be talking with the, you know, to them to share the joys and the challenges and, and that they're, they're facing and maybe some of their stories and we'll record that. Maybe we can share that, Kay. Um, and then we want to also talk about, you know, that special education issues in our state right now are in a crisis, y'all. It's in a crisis. And school social workers are involved in that as well as psychologists and every health and professional in the school building. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit more about the teacher pipeline in, in April. So if you um, did, didn't get to um, register, some of your friends didn't make it tonight, I want to encourage you that we're going to have all of this on our YouTube channel. Go to Public Schools First and subscribe to our channel. Look under videos and we have a lot of our workshops are there. We try to record everything and save it and um, and share it with everybody else. We're a small little group of about four part-time people who really um, are advocating 
for strong public education and equity is all what we're all about. So we appreciate that, that, that information. So support us y'all. Uh, you know, every time we get anybody to, to to care about us, we have to tell them how many people like us or follow us or uh, whatever you, you know, how, I'm with UK, stream us, put us on their speed dial, whatever. So join our YouTube, join our email list and um, and consider contributing to our newsletter. We'd we'll be happy to have any, your your um, LTEs or your blogs and, and, and share them. So we thank you. And Dr. Ruth and I um, also want to say one last thing is that we do a lot of uh, film work around resilience. We show the film resilience and we do a lot of tra trauma informed training for teachers and for parents. And uh, so go to our Facebook page and look under events and see when you can catch us because we're going to be showing the film about once a month. Uh, the rest of the year and having conversations with uh, with our audience and uh, because the adverse childhood experiences that are going on in our schools right now that's what school social workers are all about dealing with the trauma that comes from adverse childhood experiences poverty drugs divorce homelessness hunger um, and you know one one of the things that we had a workshop last week and Jean Nichol talked about poverty and the number one thing we know is that if you want, um, if you want to fight for a strong public school system, then fight poverty. Right? It's that simple. So thank you all. You stayed here much longer than when we met. We appreciate you. Thank you, Dr. Ruth, Kay, Dr. Bullock, and Julie, and all our guests tonight. Thank you, and come back again. We're going to keep this conversation going. We've just started. Bye bye.